nothing is impossible every chain is breakable with you we are victorious you are stronger than our hearts you are greater than the dark with you we are victorious Amen, and good morning to you, everyone. We're so welcome, or so glad that you are here. We want to welcome you here uh, as we begin on this Pentecost Sunday. Uh, if you if you've lost track of the date on the calendar, uh, it's a very special day in the life of the church. We celebrate uh, the moment that the Holy Spirit became available to one and to all, and descended upon the church and launched it in Holy Spirit power. And so today, I don't care if we got mass. On. I don't care if we're glued to seats or what it is. Today is a day for celebration. It is a day for prayer, and it is a wonderful day to be in the house of the Lord. We're going to fill this place with scripture and prayer today because that is where the Holy Spirit dwells when we're gathered together for those purposes. And so I want to begin this morning in the book of Deuteronomy. And uh, I read these words to you. If my technology will cooperate, we're going to read out of Deuteronomy chapter 10, starting with verse 12 through 19. And this is what it says. It says, uh, rejoice. Um, I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong chapter here. It says, now Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you but to Fear the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to Him, to love Him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart yes. and with all your soul, and to observe the Lord's commands and decrees that I am giving to you today for your own good. Yes. To the Lord God belong the heavens, even the highest heavens, the earth and everything in it. Yet the Lord set His affection on your ancestors, of course, talking about the Israelites, and loved them, and He chose you, their descendants, above the nations as it is today. Yes. Circumcise your hearts, therefore. Yes. Don't be stiff-necked any longer, for the Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality and accepts no bribes. Instead, my words, <laughs> he defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow, loves the foreigner residing among you, giving them food and clothing, and you are to love those who are foreigners, for you yourselves were foreigners in Egypt. This morning we have a great God who loves all, who is desperate to bring all into the fold, and we are his ambassadors and his people who love without restraint. Yes. And I hope that this morning we can sing for joy at the one who loves us so passionately. Church, will you stand? Let us sing to him and give him our praises today. Amen. 
tears may fall, my song will rise, my song will rise to you. Though my heart may fail, my song will rise, my song will rise to you. While there's breath in my lungs, I will praise you, Lord. In the dead of night, I lift my eyes, I lift my eyes to you. Where the waters rise, I lift my eyes, I lift my eyes to you. While there's hope in this heart, I will praise you, Lord. Cause the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. In the darkness I'll dance, in the shadows I'll sing. The joy of the Lord is my
to home. Lord, we thank you that your spirit is alive. We thank you that that spirit is available to us today. We thank you that your son was crucified, buried, and dead. But in three days, he was raised to life, signifying that we who die in you are raised to life in your spirit as well. And so we give you glory. We give you honor. We celebrate your name today. And we love you. The church says together your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Church, you can be seated for a moment. I want to read the, the scripture that makes this day so important. Because in the lowest place of the lives of the disciples of Jesus, they still were determined to gather together in prayer. And so while they were gathered together in prayer, anticipating hopefully something that God would do in their midst, still bewildered from the, the death of Jesus, and, 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 but seeing him alive, wondering what would happen next. It says, when the day of Pentecost came, <laughs> that took on new meaning for them, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. Could you imagine? Could you imagine right now if the Holy Spirit descended in such a form in this place, what it would feel like? It says, they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them or other languages. And so as they spoke, even though they were speaking in what they thought was uh, some sort of Galilean dialect, everyone from all over heard the same language being spoken because it wasn't to their ears but to their hearts, their very being. 
Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they'd heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they've had too much wine. What does this mean? What are they saying to us today? It's that prayer, prayer is the harbinger of the Holy Spirit. It makes a way for the Holy Spirit. And when we are gathered for that purpose, the Holy Spirit can descend in power and wreck us and change things. And it can make things happen that are impossible otherwise. And so today, especially on this day of all days, we are going to take time this morning to gather in prayer because I believe our church needs it. I believe our city desperately needs it. I think our country needs it. And so what I'm going to ask you is over the next several minutes that you assume whatever posture is most acceptable for worship. In most circumstances, I'd have us all gather up at the front and lay hands on one another. That's probably not the best arrangement this morning, but I want you to find a place that is, is uh, acceptable for prayer for you. If that is at an altar, then come to the altar. If that is kneeled at a pew, that's fine. If it is uh, sitting where you are, that's fine. If it's standing and raising hands, whatever it is, this morning we are going to pray, and we're going to do it together as a church. And we're going to take a good time for this. And I, I would encourage you, if you feel led, you can... I, I believe that there's such thing as a prayer chorus. There is a chorus of prayer that rings out. And so it's not just me that's praying. It's the entire church that's praying at the same time, agreeing with the things being said. And so if you feel led, speak out and pray and raise your voice. Sing whatever is necessary. We're going to pray to the Holy Spirit today. We're going to seek the Holy Spirit's power because we need it so desperately this morning. And so we want to begin... Uh, you can go to wherever you want to. I, I, I'm probably going to be right here at the altar. I feel like there's no better place to be. But this morning, Father, we... Uh, do we understand who it is that we talk to today? For you are the one who created all things. In a breath you spoke all things into existence. And yet for being that powerful, Lord, you have not neglected the smallest of your creation. Who are we that we could be acceptable and wonderful and, and worthy of mercy in your sight, Lord? Yet you are the one who gives us everything, who, uh, who has given us forgiveness and salvation, who has given us encouragement when we are down, who has given us hope when we see no way out. You are the great and wonderful God, and you are our King. Lord, we thank you so much. We thank you that you are also our sacrifice. That though you were the Lord of heaven and you were in, in sovereign over all things, you still took the form of a lowly servant. And you have washed our feet. And you have washed us clean. And you have taken our punishment and you have hung yourself on a cross for us. Punishment you did not deserve and certainly was so below your station. And yet, you loved us dearly. And so, this morning we adore you. We lift our hearts to you. Oh God, we declare our great need for you. And so in all that we do, in everything we think, in all the things that we perform, in all the things that we say, in all of our prayers, in all of our music, and in our time spent today, God, may we not wander off of what truly matters, and that is your name glorified. Oh, God, give us a desperation for you today.
We also know that this is an opportunity for us to come and whatever we have that we are holding on to today, whether that's holding back all of us or God, maybe if, if today we've come into this place and, and we are racked with guilt over something or, or we are so lost in sin or, or we are overwhelmed by our fears, all these things, Lord, that we can bring to you today, we want to lay them before you. God, if, if maybe we have been guilty of some, some hardened attitudes towards those who need you the most, God, would you, would you allow us to lay those things at your feet and God beg for your forgiveness? The beauty of this is not only have you loved us enough to give us another chance, but Lord, you have loved us enough to forgive us 70 times, seven times. And God, even after 490 failures, you still love us and are apt to forgive us. And so, God, may we check our hearts today. And if there's anything, if there is anything offensive that leads us away from you, God, instead, would we take this moment to lay it before you and say, God, I am sorry, but not just sorry. I am turning it over to you, and I don't want to move that direction anymore. Purify us in this place. And God, maybe together as the church, we could say if we as a church have failed in some way, if we have not taken your word seriously enough, if we've not had the, the passion that, is, uh, that, that should be a uh, characteristic of the church, God, would we check our, our lukewarmth at the door and instead be... Uh, ignited with a flame and a holy passion for you, God. Today's a day to put all of that at your feet. We also know that you're a God of miracles. And God, though there has been a lot of difficulty over the last few months, we also know that you're a God that has been our protector who has been our strength and has been our hope. You have held us tight. Lord, we know that there are those that have struggled over this time that we've been separate, and yet at the same time you've been so merciful. And so we lift up your name. And God, we will continue to trust that you will be with us. We continue to trust that you will hold us close, and God, that we can continue to, to glorify you for the things that you are doing and the things that you have done. Oh, be lifted up in our midst. We also know that even now, not just our sins and not just our failures and not just our weaknesses and not just the things that we're ashamed of, Lord, that we can bring to you, but also you care so deeply for the things that, that are wrecking us, God, the people that we care about that we just can't seem to uh, get off of our minds or the needs that we have that we just can't seem to get past. Uh, one thing that we have been doing, Father, is, is we have been sharing our requests with one another. Uh, we, we have a, a board out in, in our lobby where uh, people have been putting out prayer requests just for the last week, and God, I, I don't want us to miss this opportunity to pray for these specific needs. And so, uh, God, we're going to take this time to pray for these people and so much more. And so, God, right now, I, I, I want to pray for the niece of Mary B. and Jim. They lost a precious niece this week. And uh, we know that that family is hurting, they are heartbroken. They are absolutely bewildered and shocked. This was not expected. And yet, even in the heartbreak, Lord, that you can bring healing and restoration, that your mercy can be apparent and you can show yourself as good and holy to those who are absolutely experiencing loss that was not expected. God, may your mercy go with them. And, and, I, and I pray that the church would agree with us in this, that your mercy would be with them, Lord we pray. There's a baby by the name of Josiah who desperately needs your touch. Not a lot of detail in this, but God, you know who Josiah is. And you know jo Josiah's needs. And so God, I ask that you would fortify that child and, 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 and their parents and, and the loved ones around them. And God, if it's a health need, I ask that you would fill that baby with so much health and it would be so apparent that your Holy Spirit has created a turnaround in this baby's life. 
Leave your fingerprints all over that work, God, we pray. We ask your spirit to go. We ask prayers for Shirley and Diana, the sisters of Audrey. We know that both of them are uh, in a desperate situation, and we, and we know, Lord, that you still care for them. They are your precious daughters. And so, Father, as they, as they encounter the struggles of all kinds, Lord, would you fill them again with your hope? Would you placate their fears in your presence? God, would you restore their bodies or deliver them home? However you choose to give them healing, God, we just ask your mercies on them today. And I ask that you would hold Audrey tight as she struggles with all of these things today. There's one who, well, you know their name, and we don't, and that's all that matters. He's praying for a new attitude, a new mind, a new passion for prayer. God, today, we all want a new passion for prayer. And so ignite that in our hearts today. May Pentecost be the day that Grace Community was alive with the fire of prayer. God, give us that passion. Fill us with your power. Change our hearts and minds and our attitudes. And Lord, wherever we have failed, would you give us grace to move forward? Not just grace to live in forgiveness, but to live in glory and in power. God, we pray. Let me pray for our sister Ruth. God, we know that there is an enemy that works to discourage us, that whispers lies in our ears, that tries to beat us down with physical challenges. God, we pray for a healing work in our sister. Even now, would your healing work be apparent? Oh, Lord, give her your assurance, we pray in your name. We ask that you would again ignite this church with a spirit and an attitude of desperation for you, God. And may today be the beginning of that, we pray. For you are holy, and you are wonderful, and you are good. And it is in your precious name we pray all of these things together. And the church said, Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Father, as we're in that spirit of prayer, as we go into our message today, I ask that you would bless the reading of your word. God, give us open minds and receptive hearts. May we be locked in, listening with intent ears to your spirit, not me, but your spirit. For again, it's in the powerful name of Jesus we pray these things. And the church said, Amen. We're still in the middle of a series called Dear Theo, which we will be for a while as we go into the book of Luke, chapter 6. If you want to ready your, uh, your uh, fingers there, we're going through uh, verses 27 through 36. But I just kind of want to open up, because this has been, <clears throat> it's been a tough week. Just in every respect, I, in fact, I would say that this week has been an absolute mess, disaster. It's been hard. Honestly, I, throughout this week, I've been fretting about this message. 
wasn't sure what to, to do with it. And honestly, if, if, I'm, if I'm being completely transparent, uh, life throws a lot of curveballs at each and every one of us. And so I'm not, the, I'm not trying to give you a poor me pitiful story, but this week threw me a big sweeping 12-6 hook. And uh, what got left behind was what I normally set aside for study, for planning, for putting together these messages and making sure that due diligence is done uh, to, the, to the Word because I don't want to go into the Word flippantly and without careful planning and careful study and, and careful presentation. And I, I will say today's passage, well, I'll, I'll get to it in a minute, but it's such an applicable passage for today. And I'm grateful that God gave us this word today because it truly speaks volumes on its own. Don't you love it when the word can preach itself? I'm excited for that because I don't know if I could do it any other way. But God's word is true. God doesn't make mistakes with his word. And I believe he gave us this word today for a very special purpose. And it's exactly what we need for this place, in this time, in this city. Because in the midst of my own personal whirlwind that happened this week, the nation has struggled all the more. Louisville has struggled greatly in this time. And perhaps even in our own homes and in our own families, you've still experienced the, the difficulty with all the things that are happening at once in our country. <clears throat> What I can tell you is that my news sources, my social media, my city, <laughs> they're all filled with really the similar sentiment of anger and confusion. It's all around us. I've never seen a time like this in our lives. I don't know, some of you have been alive longer than I have, and you've seen some things, and so I, I don't want to uh, <clears throat> sensationalize things, but this is, is just one of the strangest cocktails of things that have ever happened in our nation, I do believe. And in the midst of all of the difficulty, it feels like we're more divided as a nation than perhaps ever before. Everything has a stark, divided line contrast between one side and the other, and it seems like both sides hate one another. I don't use that word lightly, but we see it all over the place now. What started the year with constant bickering about presidential nominees morphed into sharply divided opinions on a deadly virus and a costly shutdown. <clears throat> and on the heels of perhaps a glimmer of recovery, cities and citizens again are at odds with one another as acts of injustice raise mobs of angry people hurling hatred, acts of destruction, and even bullets at one another. <clears throat> I think it's important perhaps just to kind of, as an aside, just say these remarks because I don't want to ignore the things that are happening right now, specifically in our country. I want to let you know I am heartbroken for the family of George Floyd. I don't like subjects like this in the pulpit, but sometimes they have to be addressed. See, I'm heartbroken for them because they had to see his murder broadcast all over the world at the hands of a man whose sole responsibility was to protect him and everyone else around him from such a fate. And I'm also angry at the frequency with which we witness such abuse of power and the relative inaction from the systems that are supposed to be in place to hold our authorities accountable. At the same rate, I'm also disgusted at the groups that seek to voice their own heartbreak and anger by directing their blind rage and acts of violence and destruction toward those who are simply caught in the crossfire. Who instead of overwhelming the streets with their message, instead overwhelm it with fire and shrapnel and blood. I'm sick of all of it. It's hard to handle and it's hard to see. In games like these where one side has to continually up the ante, what must happen to quell the violence and anger that we see on every side of things because it doesn't seem to be slowing. Because <clears throat> violence and anger are pretty much the norm now. How do we live like that? 
Goodbye, great American melting pot. For now, we are a nation of factions. Yet while all of this swirls around us, we still have a message that rings with such truth that it must be heard. These are the words of Christ from Luke chapter 6, verse 27 through 36, and this passage alone could be the message today. So I won't try to doctor it up too much. The Holy Spirit speaks to us through these words. Luke chapter 6. But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you and pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. And give to everyone who asks you. And if anyone takes what belongs to you, don't demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Verse 32, if you love those who love you, what credit is it to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great. And you will be children of the Most High, because He is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Because He is kind and grateful to the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. As I said, this passage alone could just be everything we need to hear. You don't need me to preach it. (laughs) Holy Spirit can do all the work on this. You're dismissed. Nobody fell for that. Okay. I really want to focus on some outstanding verses from this passage. Try to give us something we can take with us here. And I think it really, at least for today, the message really centers around a couple of verses here. In verse 29, I want to concentrate on this. If someone takes your coat... Do not withhold your shirt from them. And then verse 35 says this, But love your enemies and do good to them and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great and you'll be children of the Most High because He is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Verse 29 essentially says that when someone takes from you, give them more. Give more than they expect. Give more than could possibly be anticipated. And verse 35 says that when we give, to expect less from those to whom we give. Give more, expect less. Because that is what God has done for us. Because He is kind to the ungrateful and to the wicked. And guess what? Every one of us has been that. And I highlight these verses because I feel like we can read this and we hear, we, we, we see the, the, the line that so many people talk about as we go through it, uh, to turn the other cheek. Essentially, um, yeah, if someone slaps you on the cheek, turn to them the, also, uh, the other also. And if someone takes your coat, don't withhold your shirt. That whole idea of turning the other cheek, that kind of pervades the church, and it's not the wrong message. But I, I feel like when, when we read this, we think, okay, don't return violence with violence. That's essentially what the passage says to us. And we think about that, we say, okay, so we're not going to stoop to these people's level. The people that attack us, the people that, that uh, are against us, the people that are, are trying to, uh, to attack the church or attack our faith or attack our morals or our values or the people that even attack uh, those that we love. And so we equate the Christian gold standard with our enemies as not to return the things that they lob at us, whether they're verbal uh, volleys or emotional or political or physical. We simply 
don't retaliate so that we don't stoop to their level. And honestly, I would like to say that the church is capable of doing this, but from what I see, it's really hard for even us Christian folks to hold our tongues when we're attacked. I'm not too sure where the message got mixed up, but there are far too many Christians out there right now verbally jousting, and not debate, but verbal assaults with those who are throwing assaults at them, returning barb for barb, and it is not a good look. But that's not even what I'm talking about today, because God requires something even more of His people. But nevertheless, I feel like that's where our heads go when we read this, to turn the other cheek. But this is what Jesus says. If we read all of this passage in its entirety to know what he is saying to us. If someone takes from you, don't just let it go. Give them more. If you do good for your enemy, don't expect them to return the favor but do it anyway. If you are kind to someone who is yelling in your ear and you're doing it because you are expecting them to stop yelling at you, that's not the reason why. And I believe that the church... I believe that if the church is going to be crucial in turning this nation around, which it has to be, because no one else is going to. Everyone else is living by their own code, and their code stinks, okay? <laughs> if the church is going to be active in turning a falling nation around... The thing that we have to understand and believe and live by is this vital truth. If you, if you haven't listened to anything else, this is what we need to know. That true love is proactive. It's not passive. It's not just forgive and forget. True love reaches out to the enemy. And when they take from us, and when they hurt us, and when they lob things at us, instead of lobbing their insults and their injuries back at them, instead, we, we don't just absorb it, we reach out to them in love and, and, and completely blow their minds for how someone could react in this fashion. Imagine this for a moment. You're driving down the road, someone's been tailgating your car, they notice your Jesus bumper sticker on the back, and as they accelerate past you in a, in a blur, they gesture, they gesture in your direction. You can guess what gesture that might be. They scream out the window, God is dead, and they speed off. <laughs> you notice on the back of their car, they've got the uh, bumper sticker of, oh, that politician you just can't stand proudly affixed to the rear windshield of the car and your blood boils. Who are you to say these things to me? A mile or two later, you see that car by the road with the hood up, smoke and steam are rising from within it, taking delight in their comeuppance. Ah, they got what they deserved, right? Serves them right. But you remember, ooh, turn the other cheek. I just got slapped on the road here by someone, some moron in a car who can't control themselves, but turn the other cheek and you escape the urge to gesture back and to mock them on your way past the road. And so you don't arise, you, you don't start a confrontation with them, you just drive right on by. And I think that's what a whole lot of church people would do. And that's not wrong per se, but imagine this for just a moment. So this person has insulted you for no good reason. But they're there on the side of the road, so instead of, instead of simply turning the other cheek, you pull over, you check on them, you ask if they're okay, making no mention of the incident that occurred a mile or two before. But they notice you're the guy with the Jesus bumper sticker on the back of their car. It's very hot. They're thirsty, their car is off, the AC's not working, so you offer them a drink from the store across the road.
After a while, you find out that their tow bill is more than they can afford. But you have a little bit on hand, and so you offer to cover the expense of their tow to the place that their car needs to go to get fixed. And you being proactive instead of merely choosing not to stoop to their level and not to return fire for fire, instead chose to give more to your enemy. You actually instead chose to become their servant. To lower yourself to someone who didn't deserve it. And then they saw something from you they never saw from one of those other Christians. See, this is what Jesus has done for us. This is the story of Jesus' life, and this is the reason that he is so worthy of honor and praise and glory, because he didn't come to live among us to simply ignore our wrongs and our hurts and our failures. Instead, he lived among them, and he took the form of a slave, a servant, and washed the feet of those who were sinning and, and, and filled with all kinds of unholy things in their lives and said, no, I'm here to serve you. I'm God. And you're a people that is lost in your sin and you are a people that will mock me and hang me on a cross, but I still choose to stoop at your feet. For while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5.8. While he hung on a cross and men hurled insults at him, he was praying for their forgiveness. Huh. That's hard, isn't it? You see these people out there who are insulting the name of Jesus and those who are attacking uh, the very foundational beliefs of the church and our systems of morality, and there's so many things that are twisted and wicked, and I'm not denying that. I don't think we should deny that either. There are people out there that need to see a servant level of love from the church. See, what Jesus did for us was proactively love us in a place where we were unlovable. And that is the standard to which we are to live. To not just try to ignore and to face away from the things that, that are insulting to us, but instead uh, to, to give more than they ever expected. And that is the kind of love that wooed us to Jesus in the first place. Because even though we had done so many things uh, against his name and perhaps even willingly insulted him, because uh, we didn't understand it, he still chose to die for you and me by proactively loving us even though we were wicked sinners. And that was the kind of love that won you and you and you into the kingdom. And if we're ambassadors of that same Jesus, that's only the kind of love that's going to win them and them and them into the kingdom. So how do we love like Jesus? How do we live in a way that actively gives when others are actively taking? I believe it starts by following his example and standing in their place. See, what Jesus did and the way that he, the way that he came to us, he's, he put on our flesh an uncontainable, infinite God put on flesh and became a man. He experienced our weaknesses in our struggles, in our temptations. He felt our pain. The God of the universe decided to limit himself to the constraints of the human body and in doing so suffered on our behalf. All for love. Because loving proactively makes us finally hear what others are saying and feel what others are feeling without the filter of our own preconceptions. Because no matter how it's manifest, you know all those out there that are doing things that just make us sick to our stomach?
They're doing it because they don't know any other way to be heard. They think that no one understands and that their voices are falling on deaf ears. Everyone wants to be heard. Everyone wants to be acknowledged. Everyone wants to know that even if someone disagrees with you, they can still listen and hear from your perspective. And when, when, when no one is hearing you, you have to shout louder in the hopes that it may catch someone's ears. And now that, that roar has turned into violence. Doesn't make it right. It doesn't make it good. It doesn't make it acceptable. But there are people that are clamoring to be heard. And that's what Jesus did for us because God of the universe heard creation groaning and said, okay, I'm going to put myself in their place so I can know what they're feeling and know what they're experiencing and identify with them and perhaps even take on some of their struggle so that they can live. <clears throat> because everyone wants to be heard. Everyone wants to be understood, and generally, violence is the resort of those who feel like they are no longer heard, but somebody has to take the first step, and guess what? Right now, everyone instead is stepping toward one another in anger. So how do we let our neighbors know that we're listening with the love of Jesus? I think that's the question. How is Jesus challenging you? How is Jesus challenging us? To hear those that we don't even like. How can we not only be nonviolent to someone who is in opposition to us, but serve them in the days ahead? Not enable but serve. What does that even look like? How can we help bring healing to a city and a nation that need to know that the church and Jesus actually care rather than living in their own holy bubble? Those are not easy questions to answer and not uh, questions that I hope to answer in the pulpit today, but questions I believe that the Holy Spirit has us wrestling with because our nation is hurting. And even if there's a lot of people out there that don't deserve mercy, God wants to give them mercy. Because that's how they're one to the kingdom. So my prayer today is that the same Holy Spirit that we've petitioned all day this morning opens our eyes and grants us opportunities in the days ahead to be just that for groups of people that don't expect the church to love them. Because it's that kind of love that truly opens our heart to Him. I'm going to call our band forward again. Because I believe this is a good message. <laughs> I believe it is a hopeful message. And even though it's a little hard to hear sometimes because it, it forces us to check our own opinion sometimes at the door. It smacks with the heart of Jesus. And so we're going to sing today. We're going to respond in praise. And we're going to begin with a song that is a prayer. For him to be our eyes. For him to be our vision. To give us a greater understanding than we can achieve on our own. And so we sing to him this morning, Be thou my vision. And it begins with this chorus. Oh God, be my everything, be my delight, be Jesus my glory, my soul satisfies, oh God, be my everything, be my delight, be my glory, my soul sad. 
would you stand with us? Oh, God, be my everything, be my delight, be Jesus, my glory, my soul satisfied. Be thou my vision, oh, Lord, of my Word. 
worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you.
and I will build my life on you. Today, I ask that your word would sink deeply into our hearts. Yes. God, that our attitudes would be shaped by the example that Jesus has given us. And Lord, that we would treat those who deserve contempt with the same treatment you gave us when we deserved yes, that's right. contempt. For your name is great, yes. and your name is holy. And Lord, <laughs> You are so merciful to us. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Before we dismiss, I want to share a few things with you. I, I know that Rachel had an announcement to share. Um, Y'all can be seated, um, except for Miss Casey Powell. Stand up. And Mr. Joel Archer. These are your class, sorry, of 2020 graduates. Let's give them a big round of applause. <laughs> I didn't miss anyone. No, no, okay, good. Um, congratulations, guys. Sorry. Oh. No, I did. College, stand up, stand up, I'm sorry. I'm, I thought, yes. <laughs> so sorry, yes. Um, congratulations, guys. Um, your yeah. church loves you. Yeah, We're you proud of you. Now, the best way to honor a graduate is to send them a big check and a card, okay? So yes. keep that in mind. If you want to, uh, to love them appropriately, we got to write that down, all the folks that are, are graduating. And so uh, love on them and celebrate this accomplishment, especially since this year they didn't get a whole lot of a celebration. And so uh, let's see how much we can pour our love out to them because they have worked hard, and that's the way we want to honor our, our graduates in this time. And so, uh, again, we're so grateful for you and proud uh, of what you have accomplished in this time. I uh, also want to let you know, uh, to remind you, that next week... Um, our brothers and sisters with Resurrection Tabernacle are beginning to worship in this sanctuary again. And so what that means is when, in the absence of Sunday school, at least for the next month or so, until things start to get back to normal a little bit, we will be meeting at 10 o'clock. And so if you've not written this down in your calendars yet, service begins at 10 o'clock next week for approximately a month to two months not sure we're going to read things and see how they go, but for the foreseeable future right now, 10 o'clock is our worship time. Write that down. If you brought tithes and offerings this morning, which I hope you did, it helps uh, things, and it's also a spiritual act of worship, we have an offering plate sitting in the back at the corner of our sound booth. Uh, because we don't want to be passing plates just yet, that is an open plate. You may place your tithes and offerings in that plate as you leave, as you go, and uh, uh, also, the last announcement that I want to give, I told you we're a people of prayer, and I believe that prayer is the engine that drives the church, Amen. and I, 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 especially on a day like this, we just can't operate as the church without it. In lieu of us not having a prayer group that meets right now, we have a prayer board right there in the, the front lobby of the church. If you have a prayer request, please, please put it on the board. Know that those requests will be prayed for. If you have a moment... When you are near that board, take a few seconds and find a prayer need on there and pray for it. You can even mark on the sheet, uh, on the post-it note that's up there, just a little mark that says, yes, I've prayed for it, a check mark or a star or whatever it is. People want to know they're being prayed for. And so we'll continue to do that. And here's the great thing. If you have a prayer that's been answered, I want you to take your little post-it and move it over to the victory column because I believe it, it enhances the church to see when prayers are answered and when God has, has been uh, powerful in our midst. And so continue to utilize that. I think that's a vital thing for our church, especially in these days. And so don't miss it on your, your way out. Other than that, church, be blessed. Thank you so much for being here today. We love you. God loves you. And uh, we'll see you soon. Take care. <laughs>